Hi everyone, welcome to Chalchitra Talks. I'm Vani and this week I want to talk to you about The Sense of an Ending by Julian Barnes. The Sense of an Ending won Julian Barnes uh, his Man Booker Prize for Fiction in 2011 and this is precisely why I bought this book and finished reading it. Julian Barnes is widely associated with postmodernism. Modernism and postmodernism are two movements and they both seek to voice the insecurities of the world, the fragmentation and disorientation of the society. Modernism, however, sees it as something that is very tragic. A good example of a writer who does that is Ernest Hemingway and Virginia Woolf. And Postmodernism, however, sees that there is no running away from this fragmentation. It is just a way of existence and therefore it seeks to celebrate it. The sense of an ending relies heavily on your memory and tricks uh, of the memory. We follow a 60-year-old man, uh, Tony Webster, who is our narrator, and he divides the book in part one and two. When I finished reading The Sense of an Ending, I did something that I had never done before. And I don't think I've done that to a lot of books. I immediately went back to the first chapter and I started reading it again. And this was not because I was in love with the book, but more so because my ignorant self had wondered for at least the first half of this book, how did it manage to win the Man Booker Prize? And then... Um, Immediately after it, I was just thrown away by this mundane plot suddenly becoming so compelling. And then you suddenly realize that all this time, the narrator who accepts that he is an unreliable narrator, his memory is fogged because he's 60 now and things had happened 40 years ago. But because as readers, we are forced to believe what our narrators are telling us, we do the same. But eventually it ends up in the memory playing its tricks, not only on us, but also the narrator. So uh, it opens up with an imagery and I will read it out for you. And you will realize that the sense of an ending majorly relies on nostalgia of the past and its errors. I remember in no particular order, a shiny inner wrist, steam rising from a wet sink as a hot frying pan is laughingly tossed into it, gouts of sperm circling a plug hole before being sluiced down the full length of a tall house, a river rushing nonsensically upstream, its wave and wash lit by half a dozen chasing torch beams, another river, broad and grey, the reduction of its flow disguised by a stiff wind exciting the surface, bath water long gone, Cold behind a locked door. This last isn't something I actually saw, but what you end up remembering isn't always the same as what you have witnessed. We live in time, it holds us and molds us, but I've never felt I understood it well. And I'm not referring to theories about how it bends and doubles back or may exist elsewhere in parallel versions. No. I mean, ordinary everyday time which clocks and watches assure us passes regularly. Tick tock, click tock. Is there anything more plausible than a second hand? And yet it takes only the smallest pleasure or pain to teach us time's malleability. Some emotions speed it up, others slow it down occasionally. It seems to go missing until the eventual point when it really does go missing, never to return. And just like this excerpt, the entire book is about inaccuracy and accuracy of memory doubled with time. Now, I am aware that there are not many unreliable narrators that you come across in books, but what makes the sense of an ending really different is the fact that our narrator is very much aware of his unreliability and his memory. So in the first half of the book, Tony says that he's never really considered or evaluated his past. He's never thought much about it. And he continues to talk about the past 40 years that have led to this. And he also tells you that he's never intentionally tried to hurt anybody. But in the second half, he's thrown away by a lawyer's letter that presents him with a mysterious legacy that he never dreamt of. And this letter forces him to reconsider everything he said in part one. And he realizes he perhaps never really understood what happened to him through these 40 years. And therefore, Tony is forever musing on time and memory. 
And therefore, throughout the book, you're going back and forth between part one and part two, because in part one, Tony had narrated something in a beautiful way with a beautiful memory to give him validation. And now all of a sudden, he's presented with facts, he's finding new information, there are new incidents happening that are forcing him to reconsider everything he said in part one. And I do not know if this is something you do, but I do this for sure. So instead of confronting people, I have a habit of repainting my memory with something pleasant. And also because my memory is not brilliant, I'm able to forget things easily and therefore I paint them with a beautiful picture and therefore there's no bad memory, no nothing, absolutely, that I can relate anybody with. And I think Tony has done the same thing. He's repainted his memory and now that he's being forced to deal with certain things, certain aspects of his life, he's surprised because he thought they never happened. And this is something that I feel is very clever about this book. The fact that it is quite abstract, it is musing on time, memory and history and it is playing with the narrator's memory and therefore it is playing with you. And therefore I found it a very interesting read and I think you will really appreciate this book if you have certain what ifs in your life. And obviously, if you have a bad memory like I do, and also if you like to read books that are less populist contemporary. I hope you liked this week's recommendation and I will be back again with another recommendation next week.